Hello and welcome along to the Unplugged Pod, where each week we explore the wonderful world of switching off in a world that's always on. I'm David Windsor, a journalist, and I'm here as ever with Mr Unplugged, Hector Hughes. Today we're joined by Sam Winsbury, the founder and CEO of Corogo, a company that builds and develops personal brands for CEOs and business leaders. In the podcast, we discuss how these days everyone really has a personal brand and what the rewards and costs of that are. Um, Sam, thanks for, for trekking across the water, mate. I, I watched a couple of your podcasts that you've been on previously, and I know you've got the lovely South London backdrop, so I hope you didn't get a nosebleed coming north of the water, and uh, you know, you're, you're, you're nice and comfortable here, so I do appreciate your time, first of all. We're all good. I'm a big Arsenal fan, actually, so it feels like a little, yeah, bit, little down, bit of home, actually. Yeah, <laughs> just down the road. Don't want to give away my exact... Uh, I'm going to have to mute that out. When I get rich and famous, Sam, people will be knocking on the door. Uh, Sam, what do you do to unplug? What do I do to unplug? Um, not much, in all honesty. Like I should probably do more. I'm, I, it's something I have to be very conscious of. A uh, big thing for me at the moment is like walking, running. Like I used to play a lot of sport. That was kind of the way to do it. Like football for me used to be like the only time I wouldn't think about work. Football over recent years came a bit of a, a bit of a chore for me. Like I kind of just lost the fun that I had with it when I was when I was younger. But I kind of got. A, weird addiction for walking and running now so walking and running is like my time where i'm even if i'm thinking to be fair it still feels like you're off you, you know like sun, nah no nah, i nah, can't do any of that nice. yeah yeah i had people that run with with earpods on i'm like psychopath i want to shake them sometimes <laughs> <laughs> no, i think it's important to have like time without mm-hmm. any stimulation yeah. just for your brain to to tick football i get though because football you do properly um, you do really switch off, but walking or running, the the, the brain is still moving, isn't it? You know, when you're playing five aside, it is it is a very brief moment when you're genuinely not thinking about anything else. Yeah, to be fair, I think football gives you something to like put your mind, like something else to put your mind to. I guess the reason people put like music on when they run is because they don't want other like they can't be alone with their thoughts and they need distraction. Football gives you something else to think about, but I don't know. Maybe it was just like the. I wasn't doing it for fun. I was doing it at like a serious level, which was, well, I say serious. It was semi-serious. I'm not that good. I don't want to make out like I'm that good at sport. But like, it was like, it was quite serious. I guess if you're just playing five side with your mates, it gives you that same level of just like, chill out and think about something else for a little bit. But I get that with running now. You're not going to check your phone for yeah. half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever it is. And that is quite powerful because... Yeah, I, I for one, like it's so easy during the day, like especially when you're in the thick of it, it's so easy just to just to mindlessly check, right? And so there's something powerful about just just getting away from that for 40 minutes, let alone the the benefit of exercises. I think something more people should do as well is just run, like don't set a distance, don't set yeah, yeah. like a target pace, don't set a time, get just, lost, just yeah, just run yeah, and yeah. get lost. Like it's actually one of the best things to do. Just spend an hour doing it. I feel like most people like they they get put off running by the concept of have to hit this place i have to hit this distance and it becomes horrible for them just like just run and enjoy it like it makes such a difference that's quite a wild concept though to, yeah, even as you say yeah, like, yeah. running without any like sense of time or distance yeah. or i should stop here or i'm hitting that marker like <laughs> i don't know it's uh, quite yeah it's quite feral it's the same with reading there's uh i, I was was a pretty dyslexic kid and then three or four years ago I started reading a lot and the trigger was listening to a podcast with naval ravikant super smart guy and his bit of advice, very simple, which is read what you love until you love to read. Same thing. It's like, we, we always feel like there's a book we have to read, you know, and we've all got that book that we're like slogging through. We're not really enjoying it. So just put that one down and pick up the, because it's about building the habit, right? It's about building the habit of reading and then you naturally progress onto the things you should be reading. So that's been a big unlock for me. I'm terrible at reading, so. He, he also, he talks about like giving yourself the permission to, a lot of people say you don't have to finish a book, right? So you can just start a book and whatever. But he actually says, pick up a book. And even if it's fiction, nonfiction, just open it anywhere and start. Which is quite random, right? But once you have that liberation that you can pick up, especially like a nonfiction book, you know, you can pick it up and you can literally start, you can start 10 pages from the end. And he said at any point, it should really, it should really, uh, grasp you. as soon as he said that, I was like, that's insane. Like, how many books I can get through now? Without it's a great finish. way to finish more books. <laughs> 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 uh, Sam, we should probably just um, scratch back a little bit to, to your backstory. Why don't you fill everyone in? We'll, we'll, we've sort of given you a brief 
intro off pod before you came in but uh why don't you tell people who you are and, and what you're about yeah so i guess the uh, the interesting where it starts to get relatively interesting was uni always been very entrepreneurial like even to be fair even at school i was writing blogs around psychology just because i was interested in it my school didn't offer it so i thought i'd i'd just learn it and write blogs about it through that i kind of learned about marketing learned a little bit about business trying to get people i mean no one read the blogs but like it taught me some basics and then fell into the world of marketing at uni, was trying to get all sorts of freelance marketing projects. Depending on who I speak to, I either say it was for my career or for beer money. It might be probably beer money at the time. Uh, so I was doing all sorts of freelance marketing projects. I was trying to get them. And I would like message people. I'd go to events. I'd send videos to people around Birmingham when I, when I was at uni. And everyone was like, who's this 19 year old kid <laughs> telling me he can do my marketing like no you can't who are you and fair enough right like I'd probably think the same if if I got a similar thing so I stumbled across this book by a guy called Dan Priestley called Key Person of Influence and it was basically saying like it was the concept of personal branding essentially which we'll, I'm sure we'll come on to um, so I read this book and it essentially said you know become somebody that people want to listen to somebody that people see as an expert so I thought, right, I'll go to the most businessy place I know, LinkedIn, and just started posting content around like marketing and, and the things I was learning. Um, did that for a little while. People started to take notice. You know, I didn't really get many of the marketing projects I wanted, but I had people reaching out to me saying, I've seen you posting. Can you show me how to do the same for my business? Can you show me how to like do my profile and all these other things? So throughout uni, second and third year, I consulted and coached a few people around it. Nothing major. But as soon as I got into that world, I was learning more and about more and more about this personal branding thing. Came out of uni in 2020, straight into you know what, and then just used that free time essentially to build the agency that I now run. Out of interest, me, what what kind of stands out to me about your story? And I remember exchanging some messages with you pre Corogo, uh, mm. and you were telling me that you were, you know, basically studying all of the kind of top personal brands of the world, methodically yeah. going through it, and just. Yeah. You know, ever since I've known you, there seems to be a deep conviction. Like even talking about that while you're at uni, just messaging businesses being like, let me do your marketing. Like wh where do you think that confidence came from? Interesting, because I'm not the most confident person anyway. Like I'm, I'm actually very introverted outside of work. Like I'd never go and do that to a bunch of normal people. Um, I've, I've never really thought about it. I, I've, I've always been like very driven to work. I think school and I guess good parenting just taught me to work hard. So I think it comes from that and just doing the hard things over and over again until they become relatively easy. So I didn't, I've never had this like revelation, this like moment that I switched. I've, it's just kind of always been within my nature really, which is, yeah, I guess I'm fortunate in some ways for that. I saw you had um, a really good quote and I don't want to butcher it, Sam, because I, I, I might butcher the adjective. But I think it is, is it doing great work isn't enough anymore? Was it doing hard work isn't enough anymore? Which is actually really sobering. Like you don't really want to hear that because it should be enough, right? Like you do hard work, you get up, you do hard work. That should be enough. But just, just talk us through exactly what you mean by that. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's not fair. Like, it'd be great if we lived in a world where the people, the businesses that did the best work got the most customers or got the best results or grew the fastest or whatever. But that's just not the case. Speak to so many people where they're like, yeah, we'll just let our work do the talking. Your, no matter how good your work is, it will not do the talking for you. You've got to do the talking for your work over and over and over again. Otherwise, there's probably competitors of yours that aren't as good as you getting more customers or more clients or whatever it is or growing faster simply because they're better at talking about the thing that they do than you are, which is like, it is unfair, but it's kind of the world we live in. Can you build that into the product though? Can you build a product that talks for itself? If you can build something like Unplugged, you probably can. <laughs> but, um, if you can get your customers to talk for you, then even better. Like, yeah. I think that's, to be honest, that's probably like a level above personal branding or marketing that's even more effective, undoubtedly, if you can build a product that people talk about themselves. Um, but I think there's a lot of businesses that are a long way off that. Or there are, there are certain things as well that don't necessarily lend themselves to people talking about them as much. Like a consumer product, you can understand why people would talk about it, but you know, people don't necessarily go raving about like their favorite recruiter 
mm. or anything. It's just <laughs> it's just not something that, that tends to happen. Yeah, I guess you, you see, you know, fundamentally businesses, you've got all the, the back office stuff, but it's, it's product and distribution, as, as you're kind of saying. And it seems like a lot of businesses forget one of those, at least, yeah. you know, it could be either, yeah. but you, you really need both, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's the old age that there's only, like, so much glitter you can put on a turd. <laughs> like, you, if the product's shit or the person, in our case, if, uh, if, it's, if it's personal branding, if the person's boring, got no personality, or like they're not doing anything interesting, it's very hard to build a brand out of them. Mm-hmm. You've got to have something, just like you've got to have a, a, a good product, you've got to have an interesting person behind it. Is there any, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about why people should build a brand and identity and, and ha- perhaps how they should do that. Is there any situation where you think an organization or a brand shouldn't build a brand? Is there anything that's so high-end, so exclusive or certain uh, certain parts of the market where you actually think you should, you should stay really quiet or do you think it's just absolute blanket, everyone should do it? There's a certain size of company where it probably becomes beneficial to have the people running it not known. Okay. Just, depends who the people are as well, doesn't and, it? Yeah, that's the other thing. It depends who the people are and what the company is. So there's probably a lot of oil companies <laughs> where, <laughs> where it would probably be a terrible idea for them to build personal brands. So... Yeah, there are a few, but I think the number of people that should be doing it is far greater than people think. Like people think it's reserved for, you know, like cool, exciting businesses, whereas actually, you know, your your tax advisor should probably be doing it. Your financial planner should probably do it. Like even these boring industries that people think it's not as relevant for, actually, it can be. And I guess I guess you see this a lot, but fundamentally, we do have whether we like it or not, we have a personal brand, don't yeah. we? And so I guess yeah. it's just. Yeah, everyone's, so I, I would say everyone's got a reputation. Personal branding for me is like the conscious framing of that reputation. Sure. Um, the semantics though, really, like ultimately people think certain things about you. People think certain things about me. Like personal branding is really just about trying to influence what they're thinking and what they're saying about you. You can't hide the fact you have a reputation. And I guess, so, uh, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is this idea that everyone is a bit famous these days, right? Like social media, mm. you know, we all have, we're putting stuff out in the world, we're getting reactions to it, et cetera. And historically, I think Einstein said uh, that the more famous he got, the stupider he got, right? Because, <laughs> and I, I've found this as well, not that I'm at all famous, but, uh, you know, have... Comparing yourself to Einstein is a nice healthy, <laughs> healthy start. <laughs> But, you know, like, as I've, you know, got more engagement on LinkedIn, for example, I find it takes up a disproportionate amount of my headspace, right? Okay. And so, I mean, you, you obviously see personal brands done well. I think you do a great job. Mm. Uh, is that something you think about much? Or like, is, is that something that comes up for you? Yeah. Do you get recognized in the street, by the way? Do I? I get, I get recognized if I get a niche founder parties, <laughs> but not in the street, though. Do you? No. Yeah. I've been only by like like once or twice in an event yeah. like in relevant places it's surprising isn't it it yeah. is really surprising the, the reach because you see like numbers on a you know on a screen and you don't think much yeah. about it but then yeah. when you hear some like very fl- far flung person like say oh I saw your post today it's, like, yeah. it's really weird it's, strange. Yeah. it's weird yeah um, on the fame thing like I totally get it I think the thing with fame right is that Nowadays, I think fame is becoming the goal and, and the yeah. end in itself. Whereas if you think back previously, fame was only ever the result of something else, usually being good at a certain skill, sport or acting or music was, you know, if you're very good at those, typically you become famous as a side effect. Then people, I think, started to realize that fame was a useful tool because you know, famous people are very influential. You can influence people if you're famous. So I think in in trying to use it as a tool people are trying to become famous but actually now becoming famous has become the end in itself that people are looking for which i think is dangerous because like it's it's useless on its <laughs> on its own yeah. like as an end result to chase it it's pretty it's a pretty dangerous thing to chase yeah and i think there's a lot of like you just lose sight of the objective so for example when i was doing it i was just fine to myself like this is great but unplugged and then I realized like the time I was spending on it, I was more chasing like the ego boost of getting a lot of likes or that kind of yeah. thing. And I think I, it's actually makes the case for working with you know someone like uh, like you guys where it's much more deliberate, and methodical, you mm-hmm. know? Because if yeah. it's just like, like I've seen founders who 
are running their company and they build a personal brand to promote the company and then a year in the personal brand becomes the thing and they step out of the company and go yeah. that, and that's fine like you know go, go and live that life for sure but i think uh certainly i found that at times i would be lying to myself about why i was doing this right really? it was like this is the that's best thing for the company right now it's like this is not the best you know there's a huge opportunity cost you know because mm -hmm. saying yes to that and there's how you approach it as well so i mean it'd be good to hear, hear about kind of how you you tend to what you think works well but like if you know your primary job there are some people who are just the face of the company and that is their primary job right it's pr all that kind of stuff but like it's not my job my job is to run the company uh, effectively and you know bringing in opportunities through linkedin is a very small part of that mm. not, you know again we can we can kind of yeah. I, I think there is a huge amount of benefit to be had there yeah. but i think at times i got too caught up in that and maybe at the detriment of like what's happening over here and all that kind of stuff and you can see success like someone gets touched about a partnership an investor gets in touch i was like wow this is so because it's magical right it's magical when you put a post out and yeah. you see all these opportunities come in like it is an incredible thing um but i think that the danger is just not doing it deliberately enough i think if people just kind of like chasing the likes right like that's yeah. the thing is it like if, you, if you're chasing that for the end itself yeah. uh rather than a means towards a specific goal then uh that being said i know uh, you know i know who some of your clients are and like it is the channel it's the channel for their business yeah. works really well and so it's just like understanding that as as well right like again as we were talking about earlier fortunately our product is one that does lend well to product-led growth people ironically posting mm. pictures on social media <laughs> so it's actually like how can i help that flywheel spin and, you know we have far more capable people than me working on that now rather than getting too caught up in in, in me sharing stuff so i don't know that's that's a, a bit of a why, ramble. why do you in your case was it like is it like an ego thing do you think where people like want want to be known and want to be seen a certain way is it like a just pure it's almost like gambling in a way like the constant dopamine here of getting more likes yeah i think it's both right and, uh, uh, the ego thing i think is big because mm. because it is it is an ego thing it's yeah. what you were saying earlier about like seeking fame yeah. you know it's like it does stroke your ego mm. and i think that part of the problem is because it's so like exciting and satisfying it feels like really productive but then it's like yeah. you know has this actually because you know at any one time when you're running a startup like there's probably one really big problem that needs to be solved and at some time it might be like we really need to boost bookings now and a couple of posts can really drive that but other times it's like hey we just need to like get through the due diligence of this funding round mm -hmm. and me posting on linkedin is, is not <laughs> helping right so it's, it's just understanding like what is the priority right now mm -hmm. and uh because yeah i mean i personally find it very distracting if I do a LinkedIn post that gets yeah. a lot of engagement, I'm checking, you know, maybe I just don't have the, the willpower of some people. But yeah. uh, so I think it's, I've, I've just kind of seen that in myself. And then it also sends, to be completely honest, it sends my, uh, you know, I'm, I would say I'm fairly balanced generally, but I find myself more up and down. You get the kind of high, everything's got a reaction. It's like drinking loads of coffee, you know. Mm. You, you do then feel a bit more anxious afterwards. If I'm like got a big buzz because something went, you know, got a, a a lot of traction then i will feel a little bit more anxious after that i think so yeah. and what i think you've got is that playing out many many times a day so i do think there's a, a real case for like there's so much power in personal brand as a channel and obviously you know that more than me uh but i think yeah just how you approach it and harnessing it is is everything because it's a it's a dangerous yeah it can dangerous be. game that's so. exactly what social platforms want you to feel like as well though right like they want you to be checking it they literally reward engage or linkedin does specifically it literally will rewards engagement in the first hour so that you post and then you come back and you check and you check yeah. and you check and you reply and it, i guess it feels productive because you're doing a lot of things like you're, you're replying to a lot of comments or whatever it feels productive but you're right if you don't have an end goal from it or you're not clear on why you're doing it in the first place then it is probably a complete waste of time like if you're just doing it for likes and you, I mean, your example was perfect. Sometimes it's probably like the right time for you to post. And I'm sure you, you posting on LinkedIn has probably led directly to bookings. You know, if you get five bookings from a post, it's probably worth the 20 minutes it took. But then other times, if you're going for a funding round and you're spending that five minutes on a LinkedIn post rather than reviewing a deck, which might make a 1% difference, then obviously it's a waste of time. So yeah, I think it's important just to know, know the ultimate goal and be focused on that rather than, 
getting too caught up in the engagement. They matter, of course, to an extent. The number of followers you have matters because more followers is a greater pool of people that you can share your message or sell to in the future. But yeah, you can't, you know, never get too caught up in that as the end goal. There's always got to be something beyond that. Is that where you come in, just helping brands become more deliberate then? As opposed to just like the, the wild energy, where should I post? There's a million different platforms now. You just channel everything that more effectively. Yeah. So usually there's a, there's a few reasons that would work with something, someone. The first is that they've got an idea of what they want to do and they do have a clear goal. They just don't have the time or expertise to achieve it. They don't know what to post, how to post, etc. The other time will come in is when they realize the power of having a brand and having influence but they're not sure what they want to use it for. They might have some rough idea, but really the only thing they're, they're aiming for at the moment is engagement and, and followers. And we can give them a bit of direction on, on what they want to do. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean selling something. It might just mean improving perception of the company that they work at or future-proofing their own career. But we'll give them that direction. Yeah, I saw you say um, that a company should kind of take five things that are core to their identity or that they believe mm. in the defense of the death and focus all their content around those five yeah. things. Just just keeps it more streamlined, right? Yeah, and those things are probably the things that are gonna stand you apart from everyone else. Because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of people saying the same thing mm. <laughs> on social media right now. So having those core things that ideally they're gonna be things that you will defend your grave and other people will some people would disagree with. Like if everyone's going to agree with them, it's kind of like, it's pointless, right? Like there should be some people disagreeing with it. Those are the things that make you unique and separate you from everyone else. Usually they're also the things that people are most afraid to share. I guess it's just a shift that, you know, we perhaps haven't, we, it's a broad society haven't caught up with yet, which is like, you know, marketing as a channel and, and distribution has changed and now it is much more people led because... Yeah everyone does have this presence on social media mm. and you know people buy from people at the end of the day yeah yeah i don't yeah no one in their right mind i don't think would disagree with the fact that having more people know who you are like you and trust you wouldn't be useful yeah. like it's it definitely is but as you said it's a tool not not an end and who you you, you run a high-powered agency and how do you like what does your priorities look like and what does your week look like and how much of it i, I guess for you building a personal brand is more relevant than than ever for uh, driving business growth but like where do you mm. put your time yeah so the personal brand and the social presence for me is it has to be an always on thing because of ultimately that's what we're selling if i'm trying to pitch this to someone and they're looking at my brand and they're going hang on you haven't done anything in three months why aren't you doing it it clearly devalues what we're doing so for me it's there has to be an element of always on but I also go through phases where it, sometimes it's more important, sometimes it's less important. So for probably three months over summer, I wasn't really pushing my personal brand that much. It was kind of like a maintenance phase, just keep it where it is. And now we're in a position when we're recording where generating demand is the most important thing for my role. So naturally, I'm in one of those phases where I'm going to be really bullish on putting my brand and probably going to be spending two, three hours a day on social media, building my brand. But that's right now, that's practical. Two months ago when all we needed was team members through the door, it's like, it's not the focus. I have to keep it going purely for, you know, the image and the perception of personal branding. But it's, yeah, I go through phases where it's sometimes more important, sometimes less important as well. Karoga, talk us through the name because it's, it's, it's a nice, yeah, it's a nice one. It's a good story, yeah. So, oh, you should see the list, by the way, of names that didn't make the cut. <laughs> oh, my God. One day I'm going to, like, just show the list to everyone. It was terrible. So, yeah, Kurogo. Kurogo is a term from the Japanese Kuroko, which is a, it's a term in Japanese theatre for stagehands. And these Kurogos in Japanese theatre, they basically move everything around the set to make the main act look good and make their life easy but they would wear all black or whatever the color of the back of the set was so that you couldn't see them. 
And that is kind of what we want to be for our clients. We're not there to take the spotlight, take much of the credit for it. Ideally, people shouldn't even know that they're working with an agency, but we are doing all the little things in the background to make their image and their presence look good to other people. They're like the main act on the stage. We're the, the stage hands, the microphone, the electricians doing the lighting, all of that. So do you, do you think as a personal brand grows, the the person you know it, for that brand like steps away more and and it's more kind of automated handled by you handled by the team like mm. it, is it do people come a bit you know people like steve bartlett now like yeah. i imagine he's not checking his linkedin dms he doesn't know what he's posted yeah for the yeah. last three weeks yeah that's i think that's almost when you get to celebrity level status like i i'd say he is a celebrity now but it's got i guess it's got to be a scale right like yeah you, you must see that it's going to happen. It's not, as it gets to that size, it's not going to be practical or probably even possible for him to know everything that's going on. So your, your most successful clients, how engaged are they? Still relatively, to be yeah. fair. Because I think like we're talking a, a huge, huge scale here. Yeah, sure. I don't think many people get to that level where they're not but as it, involved. It's still like, even even your post, like it's a lot. It's a lot. You oh, always yeah. get a lot of DMs. It's a lot of, it's a lot of, activity you oh, know mate. linkedin inboxes yeah yeah yeah. Carnage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a lot we i mean even for our even for smaller clients we're still trying to take most of that off their hands yeah because and this is across channels as well right yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah um so again it's just like them monitoring their linkedin box or speaking to a client what's going to be best use of their, their time speaking to a client so we'll mon- manage the inbox for them and, and just flag certain things. So they're, they're involved when they need to be. We save them from having to get involved in stuff that doesn't really matter. Whereas someone at Stephen Bartlett's level probably has someone managing his inbox near enough 24 seven and responding to everything and setting up meetings or whatever. He's not touching those conversations until he's in a meeting and he's probably speaking to one in a thousand people that, that message on there. So. Yeah, I think as you scale, you become further and further away from it. Ours are still relatively involved all the way through. And do you, I mean, I've never run an agency. I've always thought every business is challenging, but there's that real challenge uh, of people are effectively the commodity and like yeah. people's time. And there's always that conflict. You seem to do a great job, but there's that conflict between you wanting to give more work to less people to improve your margins, right? And mm. I guess, especially an agency that's very social media heavy, do you find it do you find people do get burnt out with that do you find that that's difficult to manage or or does it just kind of self-select yeah it's you do have to be a special type of person to be like what we do is not it's not an easy job it's not easy to be constantly in in social i guess a few solutions to it firstly sell strategy as well as delivery like if you can ideally you want to be selling knowledge and brain power rather than just man hours or woman hours if you're just selling it's like brains versus hands we call it so if you're just selling the hands just the doing then you basically fall into this race to the bottom of who can get the cheapest labor to do the thing and the client's probably thinking you know i can just pay a grad to do this cheaper whereas if you sell the brains that's much harder to replicate and much more valuable adds more value to them so yeah trying to focus on on brains a little bit more and build you know i guess you can in an agency your people are your product so for us training our team up to be the best they can be is kind of like you making sure every tiny detail in the cabin is taken care of and they're built from solid materials like if you if you just thought fuck it we'll stick up a few bits of wood and and call it a cabin you know it wouldn't be very successful so much like you've put a lot of time and effort into making sure you're using the right materials, everything's taken care of in the cabin, like everything you need is in there. For an agency, it's a similar approach, but to your people, making sure that they've got training, the resources that they need to become good in their roles, essentially. Um, and then you avoid that race to the bottom. It's probably quite a, as far as agencies go, it's, it's probably quite a sexy, like a lot of people wanting to work in personal brand now. Yeah, more and more so. The last hiring round we did, we had 500 odd applicants, which was wild. Like this time last year, we wouldn't have dreamed of having that many. What do you What do you look for in in a person? 
number one thing is doing something to stand out that's different. We received 500 applications. I'd say north of 400 were a CV and a cover letter. The 50 that got the interview, they probably did something like, you know, drafted a LinkedIn post they might write for me or sent a video. And we hired someone joined yesterday, they sent a video in their application yeah. and maybe three other people did that. So that's like just such an instant way to stand out. I think it is, by the way, remarkably easy to be in the top 10% of applicants. <laughs> like, it's like just do something different to a cover letter and a CV yeah. and you will be in the top 10%. The video is interesting, right? Because yeah. like most people won't do that because they don't like their voice so they don't want to put a camera on, they can't be bothered or like, you know. It's, but, you know, everyone knows video is so, uh, it's so punchy, obviously, it's something that will stand out for sure. It, it, it comes back to the conviction point. I was always rubbish at. at it's remarkable. I got any jobs, rubbish at job applications, like, and but but it's it's like that's why you started your own company. Mate. <laughs> yeah, no one else would take me, honestly. But the uh, it's it's super demoralising. Like when you're oh yeah, you're just like I always send enough job applications, be like I know this isn't going to get accepted. And that comes out right. Like that's not that's not like a confident video, you know. So but the thing is, like, I I don't necessarily care how good the video is. Yeah, just a video. Yeah, it's just like you've taken the time to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more than most people, so. Yeah, so that's that's the number one thing. If they can show that they will do something that's over and above what everyone else has done and taken some initiative, yeah, then that's like the number one thing we look for. And what about your addiction to your own phone then, Sam? <laughs> how, 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 how bad are we talking here? Is it wake in the middle of the night and look at it, or no, do you have not like a... out of anxiety sometimes, not out of, <laughs> not out of addiction just yet. Um, Historically, I've been like okay. Like on the personal side, I'm never. I'm not a massive phone user. Like before I built the business, I I deleted my Instagram in uni because I was just I was addicted at that stage. I was spending too much time on it. Deleted it. Was so much happier without Instagram. Didn't have TikTok until I started the business. Really, until very recently, the only social media I used was was LinkedIn. Now, obviously, I'm I'm using it quite frequently for you know, practical reasons to grow the business. But I don't, you know, I don't get too caught up in like scrolling social media frequently. Instead, I think I've probably replaced that with Slack and email <laughs> and LinkedIn. Yeah, and, sure. and now I'm at the stage where I am checking frequently. Yeah. And I'm I'm picking up my phone. I'm looking at my screen time. Going. I'm I'm torn on screen time. I don't know. I can't decide if my screen time is. I don't know exactly what it is. I know you're going to ask me. I don't know exactly. <laughs> what you don't what think it is. it's a useful metric, or why? Why are you talking? Well, like, about? it's probably about ten hours a day, phone like phone and laptop because it does my phone and my laptop. But I'm like, that's on the face of it, that's probably quite bad. But that's not ten hours wasted. Like that's ten hours that is actually quite productive. Me building a business and it's a necessary tool. So I don't know. Well, I guess what I challenge there is a necessary point. Like, yeah, ten hours a day necessary. I don't, I don't know. I feel like, you know, I speak for myself. You just there can just be hours of just like, just get into the habit of of just checking, you know, or or batting around emails and yeah. that kind of thing. Like, I think we all have. Yeah, everyone's different. What times of day they work best? But it, it broadly, you get a kind of peak and then you get a dip usually in the afternoon and then another peak in the evening. Yeah. And uh, I reckon it's actually dangerous to make decisions during the afternoon. Like there's a oh, there, there were some so studies that a big statement. I love there's it. There's a big statement. Yeah, <laughs> but th th there are studies that uh, during like the death during surgery in a yeah. U.S. hospital oh, yeah. went up four times if the operation was in the afternoon. And you know, obviously, we're not doing surgery over here. But like, you are making decisions that have consequences. And the problem is, like, when someone is not at their optimal mental level, like, they're like, okay, well, I'll just do this other thing that's not that important. Mm. And the problem is that then creates more not that important work that someone else has to do. And so you just you just drown in unimportant. The one job I did get was at this uh, startup, it was iPad point of sale startup, and I did a few roles there, not not very well at all of them ended all a little bit in tears but uh i ran growth for the last year and i look back i wasn't i was rubbish at it but i look back on that and i reckon 95 percent of what i did like did not move the needle at all you, you could have taken that away and the company wouldn't have changed in the slightest maybe more maybe 99 percent. and i don't think that's that unusual but i'm a lot more effective than i used to be and i still think that 90 percent of what i do yeah take or leave it that's right is that 
justification for a three-hour siesta. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> because, because yeah, like... like Convincing justification. <laughs> yeah. Churchill used to take an afternoon nap and say it gave him two days, right? Like, or at least one and a half. Because you, you come back better after a siesta, mm. you know? I also think, like, slightly controversial opinion, but if you have one really important meeting, let's say you have a really important meeting at midday, I would much rather spend the afternoon, uh, the morning, walking, meditating, like chilling, mm. you know, just, just kind of getting myself in a good headspace and then going and smashing that meeting than doing a lot of like, you know, not so important emails all morning, a couple of stressful things come in, you're a little bit preoccupied with all of that and then you'd stumble into the meeting and don't give as much of a job. I think especially, uh, especially when you're in a, a you know, more decision-making role in a company, then... The, the quality of your decisions really matter. Mm. Uh, there's a lot about just making decisions, unblocking stuff, all of that kind of stuff as well. But I think a lot of it, like companies, especially early stage, like they move in these these steps, right? There are these little moments of insight, these little things. Mm. It's all about how you unlock those. It's getting this particular deal done or you know, doing this one thing particularly well. And I think it's almost optimizing for that. And again, maybe this is this is me justifying because I'm quite a lazy worker. So I was talking about earlier, I'm not the kind of guy who can sit down and, and work for 10 hours. So I, I, I built a whole company to justify <laughs> going and avoiding that for three days. No, I like the idea of you running in the meadows before a big meeting. Yeah, that's just, just comes <laughs> off. Yeah, no, that's... Um, the, the surgery thing is absolutely that's true. Magic. And that's like numerous studies, not just the afternoon, but Fridays, never, ever... Uh, get an operation done to you on a Friday. There's, there's something else where, uh, there's a good book about all of this called When by Daniel Pink, which is basically the, the science of timing. And it, it was looking at judges deciding whether to give someone mm. parole or not. I can't remember if parole's good or bad, but basically your chance of a good result decline massively down to basically zero up until their lunch break. And if you were like the last person before their lunch break, then you, you had no, you had no, <laughs> no chance. Yeah, and then after it goes back <laughs> up again. So like, it really yeah, matters. No, like we are, it's so subjective. Like we are so subjective throughout the day. I think it's a it's a hangover from the industrial age that we just look at the working day. Like if you're working in a factory making widgets, then obviously you can make twice as many widgets in eight hours than you can in four. So so we, we have built, you know, the, the working day now is Henry Ford, like five day a week, which he actually brought down from six days, I think. And uh, like that is the kind of gold standard. We just go and it's about, you know, being at your desk. We've obviously gone a bit more remote now. And I think it's dangerous. Like, I think it's, it's you know, we are not thinking for first principles of like, we're now living in a world where it's about decision making and you just have this unbelievable leverage with everything you see from like personal branding. And uh, like, it, it's all about how to create those moments and create that serendipity. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, we're just grinding away. I do find all my best ideas come on walks. Yeah. It's yeah, not, yeah. it's not a four o'clock afternoon in the afternoon when you're, hundred percent reach yeah. for another coffee do you find that it was really interesting you said that like if you have a a big meeting you won't like do emails and do little bits you'll just clear your head do you find it easy to switch off knowing that you've got an inbox full of emails and a load of slack messages back at home because that's what i really struggle with yeah i do i uh i, I try not to be too responsive mm. i think it's like a kind of muscle i heard once uh, a story about a ceo who just stopped replying to emails and after a while, people just like got the idea. <laughs> so I, I like that. I think that's a nice idea. Um, but yeah, I feel like I, I don't see most emails as that important, you know? And I also don't see my input in that. I, I Everyone has strengths and weaknesses as a leader. I, I am not very good at doing work myself, but the flip side of that is I'm good at delegating because, you know, I'm like, I would have done a bad job with that. So <laughs> very, very like forgiving and have a very easy time trusting people. So... I'm pretty confident that like someone's doing a better job of it than I would do, um, which is yeah pr probably not quite what you're asking. So so yeah, and no, I I have made peace with that. I think yeah, I need to make peace with that. I think, <laughs> but it's still addictive. Like I still yeah you know, through the day I'm still like switching between WhatsApp, email, and you're just getting this kind of mindless. I was doing it today. Got to like two o'clock and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go. So I walked here from uh, from Bank, which is about an nice. hour and forty five minute walk, and that was lovely. You know, no phone. And that I think that is much more productive than mm. I think it's ch challenging what productivity is. It's this thing. It's the contrast between effectiveness and efficiency. Like I think we're so obsessed with efficiency, like getting more work done, all that kind of stuff. And actually it's just about effectiveness, like the results, right? And like, mm. you know, did you do the, the big thing that got all the results? Yeah. I guess people don't, 
people see that as an opportunity cost and don't take into account effectiveness. They only take into account the volume of work done. So yeah. most people would think, hour and 45 work, walk, I could have sent 20 emails or I could have written a proposal or whatever in that time. And they see that, but they don't see the next day or later that day, the bet decision that might affect you massively for the next six months. Yeah. Because you've taken the walk. Yeah, and I, but I think it's that. It's like we, you know, intuitively do not understand like what our role is, right? Like it's my role. Most of us like it's our role to send emails and yeah. do projects and all that kind of stuff. It's like no, the role is to, you know, do whatever it is, fill the cabins, you know, install the new cabins. Mm. <laughs> Most of us aren't working on cabins, but you get the picture, right? So it's like, I think there's we don't stop and think about what it is we're actually trying to do here. Mm. It's just like we are doing work. There's a good book called Bullshit Jobs. Which is basically about how most jobs today are just bullshit. You know, it's just like admin. There's a another uh, wonderful little book called Parkinson's Law, which is work expands to fill the time available. And it was written by a very amusing uh, British naval historian in like the 1940s, and he talks about basically if you give someone who's really busy something, they'll do it really quickly. But if you give it to someone who's got a whole free day, they'll take them all day and they'll do this and that. And he talks about how during the 1940s and 50s, the number of British colonies was going down as they were going independent but the number of people in the colonial office was going up like that just because it was just admin right it's just like more people working on less stuff and I think that that is a real uh, that is a real phenomenon in you look at these massive companies now I've got a mate very smart guy works in the foreign office and he's like in the civil service it's just like writing reports and sending emails and you know yeah. and I think most jobs are that you know, it's just like creating work, which is an interesting to see how that develops with uh, chat GPT and, yeah. and AI. And now that is getting cheaper and cheaper. I think a lot of people will be like, wow, what am I actually doing all day now? Because this now takes what would have taken me all day now takes mm. three minutes. Is that perhaps, like, is the fact that there's, even if they're, this is quite philosophical, even if they're menial jobs that don't add that much extra value, do you think it's bad that there are hundreds of thousands of extra jobs available to do admin tasks? I I, I think it's great that those people are working, but mm -hmm. I think for those people, it's not meaningful, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think it's great for those people. But some people don't always want meaningful work, right? Like I've been in offices where people just like, yeah. it's adult daycare. And I say that as like quite a nice, you know, it's like a nice atmosphere inside the office. Everyone's happy. Like not everyone's trying to change the world, are they, I suppose? So in some ways, you know, people come in, there's lunch, you know, they have lunch with their colleagues, they do 45 minutes work in the morning, half an hour work in the afternoon. But I think, I think my uh, concern with that is like, it's not that it's not adding much value, it's that it's not adding, a lot of them aren't adding any value, right? You can literally take <laughs> it away and nothing would, you know, you've kind of seen it uh, at Twitter, whether or not you agree with Elon Musk's um, methods, he's gone in and got rid of 80% of the company and for all accounts, you know the, the system's still up it's and still everything's operating. yeah exactly, exactly exactly as it was so yeah. i think it's just challenging that nice. and you know great that those people are working i think it's probably better they would but i can't speak for them but generally i think people can feel it if they don't feel like they're adding value and it, it's not really um doesn't really add to a meaningful life i know some people aren't no, about that point, yeah. but uh so I, I think it's better for people if they can find more meaningful work um but that's you know, we live in a big world. We're the three of us are obviously very privileged, uh, so obviously I can't speak for for all those people. But I would, I just think there's some value in challenging. Like, is this how human beings should be spending their time? The bull, the bullshit jobs book, Hector. Had I not worked for, <laughs> I didn't thought I don't believe any of that because it's people telling you what their job is in big companies and saying I do nothing. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter, but like, no, just, and, and it, it, it just fits into the bullshit jobs thing. Cause the, 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 yeah, the whole book is, is basically people saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I do nothing. And the, the reader is supposed to go with them, you know, like into thinking, no, you, you must do something. And they're like, no, 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 I do nothing. And all these different reports of bullshit jobs in there. Yeah. It was it was close to nothing, um, but just 
obviously this is probably a brief, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Sam, but like, I guess that's what Hector's saying is quite a different philosophy to, to your like, ethos and your company. Or, as in the, the bullshit jobs? Uh, no, as in, <laughs> as in um, I guess, Hector, because your company Unplugged is so framed around that. Whereas most people's aren't framed around switching stuff on. It's all it's switching stuff off. It's all about switching it on. So I mean, how do you how do you think how do you feel, Sam, when you hear something like that from from Hector mm-hmm. about like you're wasting loads of your time and you need to switch off? And, I like, think he's freaking right. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't. To be honest, I don't think there's much time wasted in our company specific. I see it in loads of companies. Don't you? like I completely mm-hmm. agree. I don't think there's loads of waste in our company, but there's definitely areas where you think what you're doing is probably more productive than it is, especially in my role, because I'm out of everyone, I'm probably the one that's pulled in the most directions. And you're right, probably, I wouldn't go as high as 80, but probably 50% of the stuff I've done in the last 30 days, I could have not done and we'd probably still be in the same position. So like, I agree to, to be honest what, what do you think that you've done in the last year has moved the needle the most like what one thing posting on LinkedIn posting on LinkedIn yeah, because yeah. that's where we've got most of our clients from yeah and it takes me two hours a week and you do you enjoy it I don't mind it yeah I enjoy it sometimes like does I, it take two hours a week though? I would challenge that like to write the content to a good standard yeah. yes what about, like, then you've got the <laughs> the half an hour a day that yeah. I'm you know, but but there is a case of like however long it takes if that is like the biggest growth engine behind the business then mm. it's well worth you know all of yeah. the time really uh, or, or a lot of it if that's the thing so yeah I think it's yeah. definitely if I'd spent four hours a week on it we'd probably be further ahead than we are if I'd spent there's going to be a point where it's, there's diminishing returns probably after four hours a week you go so so are you are you planning to spend more on it yeah yeah, yeah. On personal brand, more generally, like LinkedIn, not so much. I'm not going to be spending much more time on that. Like we've we've got it pretty nailed as a platform, but things like podcast, speaking, other channels, PR, that sort of thing. Yeah, because it is a, like that is probably the one thing that I should be doing yeah. right now is generating demand. Fortunate enough to have a team that can handle the delivery, so that's you know answering emails about delivery not really something I should be doing anymore because there's people better placed than me to handle it. And obviously these channels change very quickly. It's a moving landscape. Like where do you see all of this finishing? Like where do you see the kind of future of personal brands? Like do, do we all have one one day? Like how, how do you see that going? Not in, in our lifetimes. Like I actually, I don't think we'll ever get to a stage where everyone is interested in personal branding. Like personal branding will just follow the trajectory of, of marketing, so to speak. It will do sure. a very similar thing. In 20 years time, there'll be m- there's so many more people building their personal brand than there are now. Just like now, or 20 years ago, there were a lot of companies that wouldn't have even considered marketing. They would have been like, what is that? Or social media, don't need that. So in 20 years time, a lot more people will do it. There'll still be the same number of people or the same proportions of people doing it not at all badly well but just on a much greater scale basically i don't think we'll ever get to a stage where like building a personal brand is like i don't know eating your, eating your dinner where everyone's mm-hmm. doing it I, just, I i think it will just follow the same trajectory as as social media as running ads that's that's all and for you do you do you think it goes like do you see yourself going to more of a kind of Steve Bartlett where it becomes the standalone thing or, or is it always very intertwined with Kuroko? In personally your or? Yeah, personally. Personally. Yeah. Probably down the Stephen Bartlett route, but not on that scale. Yeah, sure. I think I personally hate that level of fame. Like credit to him, by the way, and what he's done is cool. Personally, I don't think I'd suit being famous. Yeah. Um, probably turn into a bit of a dick <laughs> if I was that famous. So similar route in that I would want my personal brand to serve me throughout my career and help me potentially build future businesses or land roles in the future and basically be an asset that works for me professionally and, and almost having a reputation that precedes you. Absolutely. Don't want to be Mr. Corogo for the next 30 years. Or Mr. Personal Brand? Do you think you see yourself go, going beyond that? I as can a see topic? myself going beyond yeah. personal branding as well long term, yeah. So yes, the Stephen Bartler route. I doubt I will ever go to that scale, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, love that. Yeah, I don't think many people would want that. Yeah. That. And people might say they want it, but... Or, or like, un, you know, it's obviously not achievable for basically for everyone. Sure. Yeah, yeah, like, it's, it, I think it's it's easy to underestimate. I mean, you, you must have a um, great idea of what went into that, having studied them, but like... Mm to get to that level the other thing you've got to remember is that it's not just Stephen Bartlett's success is not just posting and, and like the personal brand stuff it's he built and sold Social Chain whatever you believe about the sale of Social Chain I know there's like a lot of debate about that and how much it actually went for but you know he sold a business for millions and people listen to him because he sold a business yeah, for yeah, millions yeah. not because he's been posting online since he was 12 years old like actually doing interesting things and achieving things in real life is the most important part of a brand. Yeah. So the reason there won't be that many Stephen Bartlett's is because there's only 0.1% of people that build multi-million pound companies. There's a bit of a random tangent we can cut this out. It's not relevant. No, no, but I, I read it. No, you, no, you, don't. you, you definitely sure? don't. You definitely don't. You definitely don't. No, it's not. It's not one. <laughs> I, I just read Sea Biscuit. Have you read that book before? No. no. Right, okay. So, sea Biscuit. Yeah, which is a Sea Biscuit is a uh, very famous horse, like the, the greatest race okay. horse ever. In 1938, there was more uh, lines written about Sea Biscuit than like Hitler, Mussolini, Roosevelt. So, like, really, it was a sensation right. in America. But just you were talking the the owner of Seabiscuit was this guy called Charles Howard who's like an automobile entrepreneur in the US who built like a really big company uh, selling Buicks and the way he did that to, to your point was he in, instead of just selling the automobiles and advertising those he himself became like a daredevil racer just so that like people saw him as this like icon mm. who was doing like someone to aspire to be to and then that made them want to buy his like everyday family car. So there's something about like God, mate, what were you gonna say about Gary Neville? No, no, it was way more profound. I was just gonna say Gary ne- Gary Neville's joined Dragon's Den. <laughs> but, a... but it's you know, he's got a great personal brand, right? Yeah. But he's not I mean that's Dragon's Den is supposed to be about entrepreneurs that have properly made it and then they're they're passing their he's... judgment. And he's a businessman, he's... obviously yeah, he's got a great success, but I mean is there not some kind of uh, net worth Possibly. Net worth barrier before you get to go on Dragon's Dead. I I think they're just modernising Dragon's yeah, Dead. Yeah, sure. like. uh, But yeah, and there's also like, I, I agree with your point, cause, uh, predominantly it was like someone has, because you, you, you make yourself in a field, right? And yeah. they were people who made themselves as businessmen. He made himself as a footballer mm-hmm. and now he's done a great job of capitalising on that in real things. I have no doubt he's a very savvy businessman. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it probably is just that. The show's yeah, evolving. People want to so I'd like to, to see his numbers for like Salford and... Like relentless, yeah. You know, open up the self I just, sheet. I think it's a jet. Like the the next generation want to listen to Stephen Bartlett and Gary Neville's not. Yeah, 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 yeah that's true. Oh, exactly. Peter Jones is of the yeah. world, unfortunately. So I bet the power of personal brand. Nice, that's a nice out. Great stuff. Yeah, awesome. We, we we need to do a proper like outro because he has a tendency just to kill it, <laughs> kill it dead. He's like, right, we're done. done. Yes, right, so, <laughs> so tell everyone uh, where they can find you and what you're selling and why everyone should have a personal brand. Then, yeah. So best place to find me for daily content is on LinkedIn. Sam G Winsbury over there. I write quite frequently as well at samwinsbury.co.uk. So that's a good place for longer form stuff if you want to do that. Uh, yeah, you'll find out why to build a personal brand if you do that. <laughs> I thought you were going to say now you're giving it all up and you're on plus but hearing Hector's speech you know you're just like off grid and yeah you've got two more weeks of I'm giving, content I'm giving, I'm giving, up, I'm giving up all the unplugging I'm going to build a personal brand <laughs> do you want to swap yeah <laughs> great stuff mate well a pleasure to have you on and no, thanks, thanks guys appreciate it